Hi guys, I'm Dr. Tara Tobias. I want to welcome you all back to my channel. In today's tutorial, I'm going to try and answer a question kind of indirectly that I get pretty often on almost every video I show demonstrating some form of movement retraining. There's usually one or two comments or questions asking how many times should I perform this activity? How many times a week? So every time I see this question, lately the last couple of months in the back of my head i i keep thinking to myself there's one big underlying theme of any type of recovery where there's been damage to the brain or the spinal cord and that underlying theme or mechanism that is the foundation on which all the clinical decisions that I make regarding home exercises, what we do during a session, what I give to a patient to do as part of their home exercise program has to do with this word neuroplasticity. So you hear me use this word a lot in a lot of my videos and I've even used it when answering some of those questions when I get them in the comments as far as how many times should I do this. But because the question keeps coming up so frequently, I feel like it's really a good time to to explain this word that I use in a way that you guys will understand and then once you understand this hopefully it will empower you even more to make the best decisions for you in which exercises or activities to select and when and how often you should perform these exercises so this is going to be broken down into at least two parts uh, historically, I've said that before and it's turned into like a three-part series or a five-part series. I'm going to try and keep it into two videos depending on the questions and the comments that I get. Sometimes I feel like I need to do a deeper dive into a specific section, but I'm going to try and cover neuroplasticity in two videos. This first video, I'm going to explain big picture what this word means in a normal brain or a healthy brain and then how to apply this term to your current rehabilitation program. And then the second part, I'm going to go into key principles that you should be mindful of directly related to this idea or mechanism of neuroplasticity when approaching your rehabilitation program. But before I get started and I dive into that, if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I post videos every week to help empower you to take charge of your rehabilitation program following any type of damage to your brain or your spinal cord. So first and foremost, what is neuroplasticity? And neuroplasticity is just a term that describes the brain's ability to form new connections or encode experiences to learn new behaviors. And it is the mechanism by which we relearn behaviors or movements following any type of damage to the brain or the spinal cord. But here's the most important part of this video is neuroplasticity or the concept or mechanism of neuroplasticity is much different than when we talk about the motor cortex or the parts of the brain responsible for movement than strengthening. And this is where the big divide occurs that we need to change the way we think from you are performing a strengthening program to a neuroplasticity program. So put another way, your focus or your mentality is not on strengthening a muscle, but it is on creating new neural connections to regain movement on the damaged side of the brain. So there's an overwhelming amount of writing and teaching and literature on what this means following any type of damage to your brain and the evidence that suggests we replace damaged brain nerves with new ones is scattered meaning there's not a whole lot of consistency and consensus that we can actually demonstrate this that you're replacing damaged nerves with healthy nerves however there's an overwhelming consensus that neural plasticity in the manner that our brains are reorganizing 
in an effort to learn new behaviors is overwhelming. So most of the rehabilitation protocols that exist today are based on this idea that we learn into adulthood, meaning that our brains can adapt to experiences well into adulthood. So a couple examples of this is learning how to crochet. It's not something you learned as a child. A lot of people take this up in adulthood and learn it and pick up on it to the point where it becomes automatic. Same with getting a new electronic device with a new remote. You need to learn that remote and eventually, you know, you just, it becomes intuitive or automatic and how to operate that television or whatever that new electronic device is. So those are examples that our brain has this ability to learn and reorganize and adapt to new experiences well into adulthood. And so it is this principle of neural plasticity, which a lot of people term experience dependent neuroplasticity with new experiences. We learn new behaviors into adulthood, it is that theory or mechanism that is used and applied to rehabilitation programs after a stroke. So how do we know this happens? The easiest way that this is observed or that will make more sense to you is that your brain started exhibiting this ability of experience dependent neuroplasticity while you were still in the hospital, maybe even before you even started any of your rehab. So think back to that time and how quickly did you learn how to use your strong arm to do certain things like brush your teeth or brush your hair or use your strong arm to lift your weak leg or use your strong leg to hook underneath your weak leg to lift it in and out of bed. Most of you can probably say, thinking back, that you did one of those things very early on. No one really had to teach you. That was kind of self-taught. Your brain is demonstrating the, demonstrating the capacity to facilitate or exhibit this experience-dependent neuroplasticity. Now, obviously, you've heard me talk about it in other videos. This can be extremely detrimental if your goal is to regain movement, functional movement, on the side that was affected by the stroke. And so once you start rehab, a lot of times the first step is changing some of those behaviors to experiences where you are forced to use the weaker side of your body. Without rehab, if that were to continue, you that those patterns would become ingrained in your brain, those compensatory patterns of using your stronger side would become ingrained and they would get stronger and stronger and stronger experience dependent neuroplasticity to the point where you wouldn't really even have to think about it anymore they would just become automatic so that is a clear indication that your brain has this ability to learn new behaviors after your stroke so of course if you have been following me for any length of time or you've watched any of my videos that is one of the underlying themes that i talk about is breaking some of those compensatory behaviors and introducing experiences where you are forced to use your involved side to regain normal movement patterns. Now there's nothing wrong with those compensatory patterns and actually people that learn those behaviors early on do show really good functional outcomes, meaning that over time they learn how to become independent and that's really important to some people. So there is nothing wrong with that. But if your goal is that you want to regain normal movement on your weaker side, then that's a different goal. That's a different goal than just becoming independent. And that's when you would want to start introducing experiences where you are maybe forced to use your weaker side. One very well-established strategy or technique that is used quite a bit is constraint-induced movement therapy. And that is literally where you constrain or you actually somehow inhibit any type of use of the strong side. And for multiple hours a day, you just keep introducing activities to someone where they only have their weaker arm to perform the activity. 
in an effort to create experience-dependent neuroplasticity on the damaged side of the brain. It's extremely effective. There's a lot of data that supports it. One of the downsides, I would say, of it, or not downsides, but one thing that needs to be really clear about it is a lot of the, the protocols that they're using are where patients are spending up to six hours a day performing these activities over and over and over and over and over again. So very effective and clearly demonstrates that the, there is opportunities to utilize this experience dependent neuroplasticity to regain normal movement patterns on the weaker side of your body. So back to this idea or this question of how many times should I do an exercise or how many times a week should I perform this exercise or activity. And I'm going to repeat it again because it's worth repeating. That is, in my mind, someone who's in the mindset of strengthening. And we need to get out of that mindset and into the mindset of this idea of experience-dependent neuroplasticity. So let's go back to that crocheting example or that example of getting a new electronic device and learning how to use that remote. Side note here, I definitely did not get a flat screen TV for a really long time because those remotes scared me. But I knew there was a learning process to it. But lo and behold, I got a flat screen TV and I spent some time learning the remote or multiple remotes and now it's pretty automatic. But when you think about crocheting, and I'm sure this isn't going to resonate with everyone, when you were learning, did you sit down and say, okay, I'm going to crochet 10 stitches today and 10 stitches tomorrow or one row today and one row tomorrow so that I can learn how to crochet and I can do hats and gloves and all of that kind of stuff and it'll be easy for me. Probably not. Probably the more important things that you looked at to learn how to crochet was how much time do I have a day to do this? How important is this to me to learn how to do this? And then based on that, you invested probably over the course of the learning process until it became automatic, multiple hours learning it. It was experience dependent neuroplasticity. Yes, you were strengthening the brain, but you were trying to get the brain to reorganize, to encode this experience, to learn a new skill. So the take home message is, is that to get out of the mindset of strengthening a muscle and into the mindset of you're trying to learn a new behavior, and then hopefully, Hopefully, I won't see this question so frequently in the comments because you will have this understanding if you apply it just like you applied it to other things you've learned in the past or even before your stroke that you need to do something over and over and over and over again in order to learn that behavior. Now, there's one critical thing that needs to be mentioned and that is that when you do have a stroke or damage to your brain, there are several things happening to the structures, areas of the brain around the actual stroke that do affect learning. Not that it's impossible, but those are just things to take into consideration when we're applying this concept or idea that we can learn new behaviors into adulthood taking that into consideration that after a stroke or a brain injury or any type of damage, there are events taking place in the surrounding structures that may impact the brain's ability to learn. So that just means you need to modify things. It doesn't mean that you don't have the ability to do it. it just means that sometimes, depending on the case, we need to modify the learning environment or how we're delivering the information to set someone up for success. So there's a lot of great articles out there. Some very smart individuals have taken some of those key principles in which we have used to learn new behaviors in a healthy brain and taking the ones that would really be beneficial or be the most important to someone after any type of brain damage as kind of key concepts or things to keep in mind when creating a rehabilitation program for someone after a stroke or a brain injury and that is going to be in video two so i am going to end this video for today and look forward to next week's video which will really help to empower you and to focus your attention on the key things to keep in mind when you are selecting your exercises. So stay tuned for that. 
I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it made sense. Please put your comments in the description below. You never know. If something doesn't make sense to you, there's probably other people out there that it doesn't make sense to either. And if you know me, I will create a video to clear up any confusion. If you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Turn on that notification bell. Now, as we head into Christmas and New Year's, definitely have fun. Enjoy your time with family and friends. I am so grateful for each and every one of you, and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video.